everyone, and welcome back to our Plugged In webinar series, and thank you for attending today's Questline Digital Webinar, 2024 Digital Marketing Best Practices and Trends. My name is Maureen Murky, and I'm the host for today's webinar. At Questline Digital, we're focused on bringing value to energy providers by improving the customer experience and achieving program goals. Before we begin, we want to cover just a few important housekeeping items with you. First, we love an engaged audience. If you have any questions during the event, we encourage you to submit them in our Q&A section located at the lower right of the presentation window. Don't be shy, our presenters love questions. We'll try to answer all the questions during the webcast, but if a more in-depth answer is needed or we run out of time, we'll connect with you later via email. We also have the attendee chat open. Please feel free to use this function to chat with other attendees about what's standing out to you from the presentation, to ask questions, or to network. To get us started, go ahead and drop in the chat where you're tuning in from. I am live from Columbus, Ohio. We will also conduct poll questions throughout the presentation, and we hope that you'll join in the fun and participate. These polls will help all of us discover valuable insights and key takeaways on today's topic. To view the poll results, you'll access the polls tab to the left of your screen. Hablo usted español? Parlez-vous français? English not your native language? Check out our closed captioning feature for more options. We have 12 languages available. Next, we want to ensure that your webinar experience is as seamless as possible. Since some networks may cause slides to advance more slowly than others, we recommend logging off of your VPN. If your slides do fall behind, simply press F5 to refresh the page. If you're a Mac user, use Command R. It's that easy. Finally, look for a follow-up email in your inbox this week. You'll receive the PowerPoint presentation and a playback link to the re recording of the webinar. Now, let me introduce today's presenters. Brian Lindemood is VP of Marketing and Content Strategy at Questline Digital. He leads the team that delivers engaging educational content solutions and digital marketing campaigns for energy utilities. Previously, Brian was Director of Content Marketing for Manta Media, one of the largest online communities for small business owners, where he worked to empower business owners with expert advice and educational resources around digital marketing. With 15 years of experience in the industry, Jonathan Nelson knows digital marketing inside and out. He has spent the past seven years in the nonprofit world helping other marketers succeed through the American Marketing Association. In his spare time, he volunteers for Earth Hero, an app focused on making sustainability accessible to all and turning his yard into a permaculture paradise in Portland, Oregon. Now, in today's webinar, we'll hear from our speakers about digital marketing trends that they're seeing for the new year, including trends for content marketing, newsletters, social media, and artificial intelligence. They'll take us through some best practices that you can take away with you and implement at your utility. And then we will end with a 10 or 15 minute Q&A discussion to learn more and answer any questions that you have. Before I pass it off to Jonathan and Brian, I'd like to begin today's discussion with a poll question. I'll go ahead and launch that now for you. The question is, what digital marketing channel do you believe will have the biggest impact on customer engagement in the energy utility industry in 2024? Is it content marketing, social media marketing or advertising? email marketing campaigns, or search engine optimization. Go ahead and choose which channel you think will have the biggest impact on utility customer engagement. Remember that you can see all of the poll responses by going to the poll widget on your screen. And with that, I will pass it off to Jonathan and Brian. Thank you, Maureen. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and thanks, Jonathan. I, I wanted to thank you as well for joining us today. Um, you know, those those of us who work closely with the utility industry are always looking for outside of, outside examples. What can we learn from marketers and in other industries? And so, um, you know, I wanted to thank you for bringing your insight here and and helping us out with with some ideas and some learnings that we can gather from other marketers. Thanks, Brian. And uh, let's not delay anymore and dive right into content marketing. All right, start uh, AI, elephant in the room. Um, we're going to talk more about it later, but I wanted to address it here. Also, uh, AI being a replacement writer or anything like that, you know, 
Um, everyone's trying it. Uh, and if you do a quick Google, you'll definitely find enough places where people have fumbled it. Um, right now, AI, great tool to start creative, creative work, uh, not the best to finish it. Definitely need a human involved still. Um, and part of the reason are these next two points, EEAT and authenticity. Um, EEAT is uh, how Google uh, consumes and ranks content to determine what should show up on the first page. It um, stands for ex experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. It's a valuable guide to follow while you are creating content. Um, and they should be marks that you aim to accomplish in everything you do. Um, and a big part of that is if you help keep it authentic and you are an expert, there's a good chance you're going to end up meeting all of those goals. Jonathan, I, I think both of those points are really going to resonate with utility marketers. Uh, when, when we um, work on content marketing plans with utilities, this is often exactly what we're going for, right? Like we want to establish the utilities expertise. We want customers to see their utility as a trusted authority, an energy advisor that's helping the customer, educating the customer. So I wonder what, what advice you have for utilities specifically here, like how, you know, what should we keep in mind when we are trying to demonstrate the, the expertise, the authority, the authenticity of a utility in its community? Yeah. Think about who you're writing for. You're writing for someone who is not nearly as involved in the industry as you are. So take time to explain and walk them along uh, the process and your thoughts and share your insights and share your opinions. Um, and as far as authenticity goes, um, you know, that's kind of a tricky word. My general recommendation is write something that you want to read. Um, if you got it, in an email or found it in a Google search or on social media? Is it something that you would like to read and consume and engage with? Um, you should be publishing and creating content that you're excited about. And then finally, just wanted to talk a bit about vertical video. Um, vertical video, uh, barring any big changes to how cell phones operate, is here to stay for a while. Um, the big areas that this plays in is TikTok, Instagram Reels, and YouTube Shorts right now. Um, pretty much, if you're watching video on your phone, uh, you're going to watch it vertical now, um, especially your younger audience is going to watch videos in a vertical format. That said, don't necessarily just shove vertical video everywhere. If you're putting it on your, if you're looking for video for your website, consider horizontal. Most desktop browsing is still done horizontally. Most websites on mobile still benefit from sort of building things so that the, it, the video doesn't take over the entire screen. So I have a couple examples of some areas you can go to look for inspiration outside of the uh, utility sector. Um, a new book that I currently have on my nightstand, I keep going and reading through it over and over, um, rereading chunks of it. It's High Impact Content Marketing by uh, Perna Vergia. It's fantastic. It is a roadmap for if you've never done content marketing before, she walks you through how to do rather advanced content marketing all the way through it. And uh, she's a fantastic writer. It is not, it doesn't read like a textbook. It is really enjoyable. Um, and you can sort of flip through it and find lots of great information all over. Um, another area I use a lot in marketing is I use HubSpot's uh, blog. HubSpot, you know, powerhouse in the you know SaaS world right now, but their blog is the area that I go to quite frequently. It is set up to be a lead generation machine for them. It is a really impressive feat they've accomplished here. Um, and if you just go through it and pay attention, you'll start to see where they are driving their audience where people are converting and becoming leads and engaging with them and the value that they're providing to their audience. A personal love of mine, just if you want to check out a couple other blogs of how they're structured, um, Atlas Obscura is one of my favorite websites on the internet. 
Uh, it started as a search tool for finding travel destinations that are bit off the beaten path. And over the years, I've watched them sort of evolve into this media company where they are publishing, they're doing experiences, things like that. And it's clear that content marketing was a huge driver for um, their company's success. Another one that I really enjoy is Orbit Media. They're a studio out of Chicago. And the Andy Crestadina there does fantastic content. He does a piece every couple of weeks. He does videos on LinkedIn and shares out all of this information with the uh, hope of, again, generating leads for themselves. But at the same time, I learn a huge amount in my field from them. And so their company is always top of mind for me um, just because I find their content to be incredibly valuable. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we always love seeing these examples from outside of our industry and, and you know, finding these ways that we can learn and apply these for utilities. You know, again, I, I think that idea of EEAT, uh, ex experience, expertise, authority, and trustworthiness is just right in the wheelhouse of how we like to use content with utilities. You know, content marketing for us is a chance to educate customers about energy topics to inform them without being promotional, right? So you can explain programs or maybe explain the ideas behind programs without directly selling those programs. And what you're doing is using that expertise, using that authority to help customers make their own decisions instead of having to constantly you know, sell to them or promote to them directly. And in the end, I think this gets to something else that you mentioned, Jonathan, which is that authenticity right? You know, being seen as a trusted advisor that's there to help customers, you know, not just as uh, a commodity or some anonymous uh, company that they have to do business with, but, you know, a, a service that's truly valued and is truly helpful for customers. So we have a few examples to share. You know, again, I, I think that these um, fall under the category of using that expertise to help customers and build trust um, and, and really inform customers in a way that they can take control of their own energy use. We've had a lot of success with videos like this explainer series, how do you choose the right HVAC filter? And I would add to that, you know, especially on social media or for customers that are using their phones to read newsletters as an example, um, visual content like infographics, interactive quizzes are a great way to get across that information, educate customers, but in a way that's kind of fun and accessible because it's visually engaging. Absolutely. I'm going to need that video about picking the right HVAC filter. All right. We'll send you a link. And then one other solution that I wanted to mention that we've been talking a lot about lately is the idea of personalized video. We have this new platform, SmartVX, that can use customer data to create unique videos, video that's unique for each customer. And so, you know, using the customer's name, the customer's billing amount, their energy use, um, you can share this information in a way that's compelling, it's engaging because it's personalized to the customer. But then it's also relevant because it gives you an opportunity to recommend specific programs, um, you know, recommend offer energy efficiency advice based on that customer's energy usage. And we, we see that, um, you know, really just uh, as an opportunity to build engagement and make the videos that much more impactful because they're personalized to each customer's needs and preferences. That's fantastic. You know, I think the personalization aspect of it in particular really lends itself to that uh, authenticity. If you're making it about an individual, then they will definitely relate to it. So Jonathan, something else that we have a lot of experience with, um, I was glad to see that you mentioned as, as a big trend, um, in, you know, kind of outside the utility industry, and that's newsletters. Yeah, right now it doesn't seem, it seems like I can't go anywhere on the internet without tripping over them. Um, everyone seems to have a newsletter right now. And, uh, you know, half of my inbox is newsletters. And I gotta say, I kind of love it. I love getting all of these newsletters again. Um, and that people are, that people and companies are trying lots of really interesting things. 
Yep. We talk about consistency a lot with utilities. And, you know, in that case, the idea is that we want to be able to build a relationship with utility customers that is beyond just sending them a bill every month, right? Because you, you don't want that bill to be your only point of contact with a customer. You want to have the more engaging, helpful uh, touch point that a newsletter can provide. And you want to do that regularly. Uh, and, you know, certainly, a, you know, say a monthly newsletter is, is a way to do that. Yep. No one likes parting with their money. So uh, having a form of communication where you aren't asking for money and you're just providing value, um, I think, is a fantastic route for any organization to go after. But I think utility companies in particular, I think there's a huge opportunity there for um, for them to be ones that help educate and reach out to their community. I'm uh, like, it sounds like you are, I'm an avid newsletter reader myself. One of the ways that I think about that is that newsletters kind of cut through the digital clutter. And that may sound counterintuitive because, you know, newsletter is about sending more emails, right? Like it, it may be that some people might think of the newsletter itself as clutter. But when I think about that, it's, you know, with the newsletter, I get all of the news that I want directly in my inbox. I don't have to go and like to some news site, sift through a bunch of headlines that I might not care about or search for news. And, you know, who knows what you're going to find when you when you start doing searches for stuff. You know, with the newsletter, you get it like the, the information that you want in one place. And, you know, to me, that saves it just as a consumer, right, as a reader of, of news, uh, it saves time and it really kind of cuts out a lot of that digital clutter if I was going off somewhere else trying to find all that information on my own. Yeah, you know, I think newsletters absolutely stand out among digital clutter. I think about it the same way as mail. 95% of the mail I get, I don't really want. Um, it just sort of shows up, it's bills, <laughs> it's, you know, coupon books or whatever. But on the occasion I get a piece of mail I really want from a friend or a family member, those brighten my day. Um, and I think newsletters can do a similar thing. So outside of industry, like I mentioned, there's a huge number of newsletters out there. Um, there's newsletters for everybody. Um, one I'd like to call it in particular is the skim. They've been doing it for a while and their whole business is their newsletter. So they're very, very good at it. And I think they do an excellent job on delivering on the promise they make to um, everyone who signs up to receive their newsletter. Uh, you know, they tell you you're going to get a high level view of everything that's sort of going on in culture in, in the United States. And that way you're prepared to sort of jump in and be part of conversations. But I would recommend go out there, find some newsletters you like, sign up for a couple and just see what other people are doing. Uh, I'm a big fan of stealing inspiration from all sorts of places. Uh, I don't think you have to reinvent the wheel and come up with something brand new every single time. But, you know, make something that's your own. This is uh, another newsletter about emails and newsletters. So if you really want to get into it, it's called Really Good Emails. It is something that I get in my inbox every week. And I, gener I almost always take something away, some sort of new idea to try out um, and to test with our own product. So fantastic place if you're just looking to start learning more about newsletters in general. That's great. I love seeing these examples. Um, I've, I have a couple um, utility examples to share of um, ways that I think utilities are doing a really good job with this. Um, so this one is the, the town of Benson, North Carolina. Um, when we started working with Benson, they um, had been sending a print newsletter. But, you know, among other challenges with, with print, um, they were having trouble being timely. You know, it's the, the, the deadline to have a, a uh, newsletter printed in advance of sending out the bill was was pretty long and just didn't allow them to have that flexibility of, of including uh, more timely or, or current content. So, you know, certainly the, the digital format helps solve that, but it also opens up a lot of other opportunities to include videos and infographics and the kind of engaging content that you obviously can't do with print. One of the ways that I think Benson is doing an especially good job with this is you can see from the, the um, kind of top piece of content that they include here is a message from the town mayor. So Benson is doing a really good job of 
uh, kind of customizing the newsletter. We talk about authenticity as one of the benefits of a newsletter. This is a great case of building that personal connection with the with their customers um, and having that kind of direct outreach from the mayor that includes community news, um, you know, those, those kinds of updates that local residents are going to be interested in. Um, you know, and then, of course, we have the, the energy content and the other kinds of advice that we talk about, um, you know, sharing that that expertise and uh, establishing the the town utility as that trusted advisor. Like you mentioned there, and back to what we were talking about in content marketing, building that trustworthiness um, and building that relationship with your audience. Um, Newsletters are a fantastic tool for that. Another great example, you know, especially when it comes to educating utility customers, is Swebco, Southwestern Electric Power Company. In in the case of Swebco, their their goal with the newsletter was really specifically about building awareness for their energy efficiency programs. Um, in in the states that they operate in, they have specific um, goals that they need to you know sign up a certain number of customers for their energy efficiency programs, and we're looking for ways to um, you know to build that awareness and ultimately drive signups. So, you know, as we mentioned earlier with content, this is a great way to build awareness about a topic, to educate customers about a topic without, you know, directly promoting that necessarily, you know, giving customers the information they need to make their own decision. And in the case of Swepco in their newsletter, this was a great way to really to drive awareness and ultimately participation in their energy efficiency scores. Swepco also found kind of a follow-on effect of that. Uh, they also saw a boost in their customer satisfaction scores, which is a big benefit of increasing participation of the energy efficiency programs. Yeah, I think that's a great example of um, how newsletters can go beyond just you get open rates and people see your stuff. It really has an impact on your overall brand and company health. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan and Brian. I'll let you two catch your breath for a minute and I will launch our second poll question of the day. The question is, how important do you think personalization will be in energy utility marketing strategies in 2024? Do you think it will be extremely important and be a top priority? Somewhat important, it will have a moderate impact. Not very important, other factors will take precedence. Or not important at all, it won't make a difference. Go ahead and choose your answer. I'm really curious to see how important you each think that personalization will be in 2024. Quick reminder that you can send in questions at any point in time in the Q&A widget on your screen. Q&A will be coming up quicker than you think. All right, and with that, I'm going to close out the poll and pass it back to Jonathan and Brian to take us through some trends with social media and AI. Great. Thank you, Maureen. All right. On to social media. Um, big one in the space, especially right now. Social media is going through some stuff. Um, mainly, big one around X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, and new services coming up to replace them. Uh, a big one are Blue Sky. It was created by uh, the former founder of Twitter, Jack. And Threads, which is the sort of Twitter version of Instagram. Um, from Meta, and then there's Mastodon, an independent one. Um, those are sort of the big three that I see right now. As far as what you should do about this and what you should do if you already have a Twitter account established, um, you know, I think it's up to you. Uh, again, follow the guidance of go to where your audience is. Uh, in my experience, Threads has been, you know, a highly visual and creative place, probably because it's tied closely to Instagram. And Blue Sky is most like Twitter. Um, over the next year or two, I think both you're going to see grow and change and attract um, their own unique audiences. So my recommendation right now, unless you're real gung-ho about it, I wouldn't jump in and uh, necessarily commit a ton to it right now, but definitely keep an eye on them. Jonathan, a, a lot of utilities use social media as a customer service channel. Um, in addition, or, or maybe even instead of, you know, we, we might think of as social marketing. When you, you know, as you were mentioning kind of different um, newer platforms or Twitter alternatives, 
do, you know, are, are there any of these platforms that are, you know, better or worse for, for doing that kind of um, customer service engagement versus uh, social marketing? Sure. So for customer service engagement, you know, Twitter's still pretty good at it. Um, if your audience is there and they know you're there, it has DMs, it has the structure set up to sort of do the customer service interaction where you can take things private um, if necessary, involving you know, sensitive information. Uh, my other recommendation would be Facebook, largely because it's almost ubiquitous at this point. Everybody's on it. It has a good messaging system. And there's plenty of tools that sort of hook into Facebook that can help your customer service team, depending on how complex and uh, how much data you need to mine from it and, and what your management system is like. Moving away from text space, TikTok and Reels, all video, all audio, it's a fantastic place to do sort of educational content, entertaining content. Utility companies might not necessarily think they're out there to entertain always. You absolutely are. When people are on social media, they're looking to be entertained. They're looking for value. They're looking for something to make their day better. Um, they don't necessarily want to be reminded that there's an electrical bill coming up or anything like that. Social media and content marketing are linked very closely together um, to the point that I don't think one works super well without the other these days. Uh, that said, social media, um, especially for companies, organic reach is not super kind and has in, been in decline for years now and it's continuing to decline. So when you're on there and you're posting, don't just get discouraged if no one's seeing your stuff. It really, uh, you know, one out of 10 of our posts really pop off and do what we want it to do. Um, and it's just sort of how the system works. And then finally, um, just want to call attention to a change to LinkedIn that happened in June. They did something that most social companies don't do. They uh, did a major algorithm update to their feed, and they kind of told us how it worked. Short version of it is their feed works very similar to the EEAT um, system we were talking about earlier. So expertise, authority, trustworthiness, if you can do that with posts on LinkedIn, you'll be able to get some really great engagement. So some examples outside of uh, utility that I think are great places to draw some inspiration from. Milwaukee Public Library is phenomenal on TikTok. And it is very much not what you would expect a library to be. They went well out of their way to create their own voice, to have fun with it, um, and to engage their community and to get people excited about coming to the library. And so for anyone who isn't on TikTok, this is the current trend going on where people show off their uh, brand new fancy cars and uh, TikTok has had a blast sort of, sort of making fun joke videos of uh, their own cards and Milwaukee Public Library. One more I'd like to sort of draw attention to is a company called SparkToro. They're great because they use their employees and their founder and their leaders to do all a lot of their social promotion. They don't do it through their brand, they do it through the people. And I think that strategy is an interesting one and one that has proven very effective for them. Uh, and a lot of it is through sort of low production, low cost videos that just are full of information and value. So uh, they're a fantastic example of you can do a lot with um, not a huge budget. As I mentioned, uh, utilities often are using social channels as um, customer service channels uh, to, you know, field customer field and answer customer questions. I think a great intersection of, you know, what we think of as social content or content marketing and that customer service is when it comes to outage. So we have seen some great examples of utilities using social channels to inform customers about outage, but also to prepare them to give information in advance of outage. Um, you know, so we have examples here from Con Ed where they're in advance of an outage, making sure that customers know how to report an outage if that happens and to use social channels to do that, to use Twitter, X, to, to actually report an outage. And then a few other examples here, more on the side of being fun, engaging, 
little bit educational, a recipe video, which again are very popular on TikTok. But in this case, the idea is you're sharing uh, low energy recipes that customers can make without using a lot of electricity. Um, and then, you know, seasonal or holiday content also always plays well on social media. Those kind of timely touch points that play really well because it's so immediate and because you can, you know, share it in real time more or less. All right. The elephant in the room, artificial intelligence. As I'm sure everyone else has seen in headlines everywhere, it seems like something's new with AI every single day. And it kind of is true. A lot of companies are trying new things, adding it into existing products. Um, one area that I think has really nailed it, if you're looking for a great application of AI, in my opinion, is in Adobe Photoshop right now. It has done the incredible thing of adding AI into there, making workflows and making some, you know, challenging pieces of work much easier to accomplish without ever actually replacing designers, in my opinion. AI is machine assistant. It is robots that are helping you accomplish something. It's not really replacing anything right now. It's a great starting point for creative work and brainstorming. Um, I go to chat GPT all the time and just have it write me headlines and things like that. If I run into writer's block, I find it's a good way to sort of um, get over some of these hurdles, but I don't rely on it to actually create for me. All of it has to go through a human still um, and has to be edited and, you know, made into something that feels authentic. That said, don't wait around to get started with this stuff. Um, get comfortable trying some of it out. Uh, right now is a perfect time to sort of trial and error, and learn, give whatever tool you want out there a shot. Um, I think we have some examples in a little bit. It's here to stay. This is going to be the next internet, the next smartphone. This is something that's going to change how everything functions. Jonathan, some of the concerns that we have heard from utilities regarding AI revolve around accuracy and security. So on the one hand, you know, can you trust the, the work that AI is generating? Uh, and, and I know we've all, you know, read in horror stories, some of them pretty comical about generative AI platforms just, you know, fabricating uh, information, fabricating articles or facts. Um, you know, so you have the accuracy concern on one hand, and and the other is is security. Like, can you? Is there a danger in like sharing too much information with AI, or you know, compromising customers' personal information in that process? That's a big one. Um, but simply, you know, I wouldn't trust everything that comes out of AI right now. Like I said, it should all pass through a human um, and double check and uh, edit it to make sure that all of it is correct. Um, and as far as security goes, uh, that one is sort of an open question right now. I wouldn't be throwing too much personal information into AI right now. There's not a lot of transparency into how it wor necessarily works and where that information is stored and where it's coming from. I would imagine over the next couple of years, we're going to learn a lot more about that. Um, and I'd expect uh, to start to see some more uh, legislation around AI to put up uh, some sort of guardrails and regulations to um, try to safeguard some of those things. But right now, I would keep uh, personal information out of it, mostly because we don't necessarily know where it goes, unless you happen to own your own AI. One of my favorite posts about AI is from an agency called IDEO. They do really innovative work um, and they're always sort of at the cutting edge they wrote a great post about five ways they're using it using it at work and it's very similar to how i use it it is a fantastic tool to add to the creative toolbox um, and it can help generate new ideas and new perspectives but it doesn't replace any of the others completely just yet so i have a couple examples to share from utilities and these definitely fall under the category of helping humans do their jobs better, not replacing humans. And Jonathan, I, I appreciate and, and totally agree with your sentiment there. So in this first example, um, this was a campaign that we worked with PSEG Long Island on to introduce a new time of use uh, rate, rate plan. And 
in the campaign, we wanted to uh, be able to um, create segments based on how customers would be impacted by the new rates. And then especially to be able to reach EV owners with a special EV rate and that sort of thing. So we worked with a company called GridX um, that we partner with on uh, campaigns like this, who does the, the rate analysis and is able to create those segments. And then the campaign itself, of course, is is created by by humans, but you know, really um, being able to leverage and and personalize the message to those segments that the algorithms were able to identify. Another example, kind of along the same lines, in this case, we partnered with Blastpoint, who does this kind of segmentation around programs and, and identifying customers who what they say have a propensity to participate in a program. So in this case, with working with Duquesne on their e-bill promotions, um, we wanted to identify different customer segments who were more or less likely to switch to paperless billing, you know, using the segments that the algorithm, uh, again, was able to identify. Um, we were able to target that messaging uh, based on the propensity that we identified um, where, you know, those segments would be more or less likely to, to adopt e-billing. I love seeing how both of you are anticipating marketing trends. Before you both share some best practices, I'd like to do our final poll question of the day. The question is, which digital marketing metric do you prioritize the most when measuring the success of your energy utility marketing campaigns? Your options are conversion rate, like signups or purchases, your engagement rate, likes or comments, your return on investment, or customer satisfaction, like surveys or feedback. Q&A is coming up quick, so put your thinking caps on and send in those questions. All right, and I will now close out that poll, and Jonathan and Brian, take us home. Great. Thanks, Marie. Um, and to wrap it up, we have some best practices that sort of apply to everything. And we've touched on a bunch of these throughout. Number one, and one of the ones that I think is most important to always keep in mind is go to where your audience is, not where you want to be. Um, make it easier for your audience. If they're already all hanging out on YouTube, maybe you should be on YouTube too. And then utilize personalization and segmentation. Uh, in particular, I think this is really relevant with emails. Um, you know, with newsletters, you might want to have a newsletter for small business owners. You might want to have a newsletter for single family homeowners. They might need very different information. And by tailoring it for your audience, you're going to see higher engagement um, in getting people to read your content and information and get the message you're trying to convey. This is something we've seen a lot of with, with utilities as well, Jonathan. And I, I feel like this drive for personalization is really coming from the customers, that that is a basic customer expectation, you know, based on all, all of these other examples that you've shared, right? Like every everywhere that customers are online, every customer that they're doing or every business that they're working with online has some sort of personalization approach that's kind of set that expectation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, that leads right into this third one of don't get bogged down by what you read are other companies' best practices. So if you have limitations on how much you, what your capacity is for creating segmentation, the data you have, work with what you have and just do the best you can. Like, don't be worried about necessarily following every single best practice to the T. Um, what really matters is you're following through on what works for you and what works for your audience. And then finally, Make sure your marketing strategy is driven by business goals, not that your marketing is driving what the goals are. So you should communicate for a reason. Um, everything you do should have a purpose. Don't just say, we need to get a blog post up every week and start doing blog posts that aren't super valuable. I'd say it's better to miss a week than to put up a post that's not meeting your needs and not meeting your goals. I think that last point is so important, Jonathan. And uh, I know that, you know, as, as marketers, no matter what industry we work in, we've all had situations where a client comes to us and says, oh, I want to make a video about X or, oh, we, we need to get on TikTok. And, you know, and the answer is, is always or should be, why? 
Like, you know, why, why do you need a video? Okay. Well, you know, who, who's the target audience? What's the, you know, what's the topic? Is this really the best, you know, what's the campaign goal? Is this really the best way to approach this? And, you know, it, you may end up making a video, but there are a lot of questions that you need to answer before you actually make the decision of the video is the best, uh, is going to be the best ca- uh, channel or the best asset for whatever that particular goal is. So I've a few examples of, of those things to share here, especially with segmentation and personalization, which, as we mentioned, I think are just, you know, so important as uh, a basic customer expectation these days. Um, so in this case, this is a, um, a key accounts newsletter for AEP Ohio. And so in this case, our approach was to segment the list of business customers that AEP Ohio was trying to reach and to really focus in on a few of their bigger segments based on industry and ensuring that the content going to those customers is relevant, that it's specific for those industries. And as you can see here, it drove just incredible results. And I I think this just really underscores the point that you know, customers will engage with content that they're interested in, that's relevant to them. And in the case of business customers, focusing on industry is a really way to get there. And one other example to share with personalization, uh, in this case, this was a payment assistance campaign that we worked with PSE&G on uh, during the pandemic in a case where there was a lot of concern about customers who um, weren't able to pay their utility bills uh, during the kind of Um, uncertain economic period in the early days of the pandemic. In this case, we had a lot of success reaching customers and helping customers sign up for this payment assistance program with personalization. So, you know, in the message, not just using the customer's name, but, you know, actually sharing with the customer in the email, the, um, their past due balance, how much they owed on their bill. And then more importantly, when the customer clicked through from this email, they landed on a personalized landing page that was pre-populated with the customer's information. So PSE&G had great success with this campaign, and we really credit it to that personalized approach where, you know, we're helping customers by providing the information that's specifically relevant to them, and then making that sign-up process as easy as possible by pre-populating that personalized information. So I know that you have all had uh, a lot of great questions coming in. We appreciate that. I'm going to turn it back over to Maureen so we can get to some answers for you. Awesome. Thank you both so much again. That was a ton of helpful information you shared. And now I think we're ready for some Q&A. So let's jump right in. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you again so much for joining us. We're really excited to have you here. And like Brian mentioned, we have a lot of great questions in here. So Brian, Jonathan, you ready for some answering? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So first question um, we had in here is from Brad. Um, he asked recommendations on how many articles or the length of articles to include in a newsletter. Um, Jonathan, do you maybe want to kick us off with that? Sure. Um, I don't think I have a exact answer for that um starting out i'm kind of a fan of rules the rules of three or five so i'd say that's a good place to start but you're going to figure out how much you should include in each newsletter um, as you're doing it and as you test and evolve um, and involve the product i will say as one piece of guidance make sure that what you're adding to the newsletter is providing value um you know don't add fluff to it or anything like that. Um, if if you have two articles that are great and uh, get everything you need across, go with two articles. Well, thanks, Jonathan. One one thing I'll add to that, and we have uh, with our um, newsletters that that we send for utilities at, at Questline, we've experimented with number of um, number of articles in it. Um, we've tested four articles, five articles, six articles. And one thing I'll say about that is I I don't think that there's a uh, customer impact in making the newsletter too long. In other words, there's there's not, you know, there's not a drawback to having six articles, but there is a kind of a point of diminishing returns. So the other thing that we found in that is your top article is always going to get the most views. 
and your second article is going to get the second most views and the third article the third most views more or less and you know so you want to think about that when you're structuring your newsletter put the most important article up top and then when it comes to adding that fifth or sixth piece at the bottom of the newsletter you know again not really a drawback to doing that except that at some point it, it's just not going to not going to get very many views and so you have to kind of decide is it is it worth you know the the effort whatever that you know the the lift is to get that that final piece in there versus how many people are actually going to see it perfect thank you both um i did want to let the audience know we are technically at time um i'm going to go over time a little bit because i want to get to some of these questions that you all asked so if you have to drop off we understand um this is being recorded and we'll share that out with you but if you can stay on stick with us for a little bit so um, with that said, our next question here was from Mark. Um, he said, customers increasingly expect and value personalization, but it's tough for most companies to deliver. He's interested to hear some best practices and tactics for utilities to deliver on personalization in ways that their teams and systems can support. Brian, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I can I can get started. The the first thing I'll say is that um, it, it may not be as, as difficult as you think. Um, almost any email platform now is going to have personalization capabilities built in. Um, the, you know, Questline's Engage platform that we offer to utilities has that, you know, the personalization and segmentation capabilities baked in. Uh, and I'm not, you know, not just to promote Engage, but I mean, really any any email platform is going to be able to do that these days. In, in terms of getting the data and using the data, which often, you know, people think of as, as the real hurdle, like, or it's great, the, the email uh, capabilities are there, but how do I actually get the data? I, I will also say that that's probably easier than, than you suspect. We showed that example a minute ago of the campaign we did for PSE and G and the, the campaign, there were, certain, you know, a, a lot of fields that we were personalizing on in that campaign customer's name, account number, the, the past due um, amount that they that they had, which programs they were eligible for. The, the data needs and the way to handle that data was actually pretty simple. I and, mean, you know, managing a campaign like that is, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say we make it look easy, but, it, you know, we, we can handle data like that really just from a CSV file, a flat file. It's, we're not talking about having to set up an API that goes directly into your customer information system or something like that. We we can do that if if you know if if we need to, but you really don't need to. You can, you know, we can get that data um, export, you know, only the fields that you need with a CSV file and then you know securely transfer it, of course, but handle it that way. So I, you know, I my, my advice, I guess in general, is um, don't let the fear that that might be difficult stop you from looking into it because you, you I think that you would find that a lot of times those hurdles really aren't as tall as, as you might think they are. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. Um, you know, just reiterate, don't let the phrase personalization scare you away from it. Start with one piece, get comfortable with it and build from there. Yeah. Love that. Awesome. Our next question is from Wendy. Um, Jonathan, you answered a little bit in the chat, but seeing if you guys have any more to respond to this. She asked, are there any utilities out there who have a TikTok platform they're using? Is it getting traction with your customers? I shared the one about uh, Northeast Ohio Sewer District, which I think you guys shared with me also. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a ton of other off the top of my head. Um, I'm not sure if you do, Brian. The, yeah, and the, the library example that you shared in the presentation, I love that. The, those guys are doing a great job. Um, I, I do not have any other examples. I mean, I'll tell you, we, we get this question on a pretty regular basis. I think a lot of utilities are interested in TikTok, but they, you know, they want to know who else is doing it. And so we feel this question and we look into it. And every time we look into it, the answer is like, not really. I hard to find somebody who's doing it at all, much less that you would want to recommend is doing a good job. Um, it, it, you know, it seems like utilities just are not finding that they have to, or it's that, you know, they, they haven't yet had to incorporate that into their strategy. 
I will say one area that I think um, does really well, uh, and it's not quite a utility, but it is a public service, is around uh, national parks and our park system in the United States. I think uh, I'm, I'm regularly impressed by uh, the content park rangers put out. Mm -hmm. She had a quick follow up and just curious if you guys have seen this at all, um, but they're actually restricted from using a TikTok account. Um, and she was wondering if any utilities using Reels have you guys seen Reels being used, or is it mostly TikTok from your point of view? I see Reels used um, by a lot of companies, pretty much identically to how they use TikTok. Um, in fact, a lot of times I see the exact same content on um, both from uh, same companies, in part because there is, uh, you know, a lot of people still have not adopted uh, adopted TikTok as a platform. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Reels is built into Instagram, which has, um, a far greater penetration into uh, into the market. Awesome, thank you. All right, I think this will be our final question next up here. Um, Tiffany asked, would you say that the digital marketing strategy would be significantly, significantly different for a utility company who is also a monopoly? <clears throat> I, I love that question. That's exactly the kind of thing that we, um, spend our days thinking about, you know, what, how, how is the relationship that a utility wants to build <clears throat> with its customers different from any other kind of company uh, that's, that's doing marketing or promotions? I, I think the biggest difference boils down to, you know, mo most companies doing marketing, their goal is to retain customers, uh, to keep those customers coming back, buying more, um, you know, make another purchase, hang around as long as you can. Think about, you know, a subscription type service that, you know, it's a lot of its promotions to existing customers are about that renewal. Um, they, you want them to keep subscribing, right? The difference for utilities, of course, is that our relationships with customers last 10 years, 20 years, you know, a lifetime, whether the customer likes it or not. Um, and I think in, in the past, decades ago, there was a tendency maybe for utilities to take, um, kind of take that for granted, right? That there, you know, we really didn't see a lot of um, this kind of engagement from utilities more than 10 years ago uh, because, you know, they, they just assumed that their customers were going to be their customers forever and they didn't have to, to build those connections with them. You know, so, the, you know, my answer to how it's different is, I would say that it is important to maintain strong customer relationships, to maintain good good engagement, um, not despite the fact that you're going to have your customers for decades, but because you're going to have your customers for decades. Um, you know, I, what what would be worse than than having somebody who you know begrudgingly is your customer, even though they're not satisfied with service, they don't have good feelings for you, they don't respect your your authority as as their service provider, right? Because your customers are going to be your customers for so long, that is the reason to build strong relationships and strong engagement with them. Uh, and then, of course, the follow-on benefits to that relationship are being able to activate them to take advantage of programs, to learn about new rate plans, to be aware of emergencies like outages, et cetera. It's, you know, there are lots of benefits to having that strong digital relationship, but the, you know, the, the length of the relationship, I would say, would be at the top of that list. It's really interesting. I've never considered uh, a marketing plan for a monopoly before. Um, you know, from my point of view, uh, I would say I'd, I'd just my first guess is I'd focus a, a, a lot on building brand and building your branding. Um, branding tends to be a long term play. Uh, and it'll build trust with customers, especially long-term customers, like you were saying, customers that exist for decades. Um, that's, that's a very unique relationship. Awesome. Thank you guys. Um, and I lied. I'm going to ask you one more question because this one came in and I think it's a really great question. Um, just especially as you know, we've been talking a lot about energy rates rising. That's been a hot topic throughout this whole year. So um, Wendy asked, which platforms do you recommend to engage low income customers? Um, that one's a little bit tricky. You know, I would, I would probably guess uh, Instagram as sort of if you're looking at social, just because of 
um, sort of the high levels of engagement on there, um, and it has some positive growth numbers right now. Um, outside of that, you know, newsletters, they're free. Email services are free. Um, that I think would be a great channel for that, for that space. Um, e email is accessible to many people. We, we have seen um, at SECC, the Smart Energy Consumer Collaborative did a study on this. It was a number of years ago, but I, I, I would be surprised if this had changed much, but th they found that digital penetration, low income cust um, customers access to digital tools was about the same as the general population. The difference was they were more likely to use phones and less likely to have, say, like a laptop or a desktop computer at home. Um, and and so, like Jonathan, your your the the platforms you suggested just now, I think, are right on. Like you know, think of a digital connection, but on the phone. So you know, email, yes, make sure it's mobile friendly. SMS, definitely, and then you know, Instagram would be a good place to start with with social. Um, I, you know, in, in yeah, it's I, I I wouldn't necessarily think that that you the platforms you reach low income customers on are totally different, but just keep in mind that it is definitely more of a mobile experience when it comes to you know how you're designing your emails or maybe you know make sure you're doing SMS as well as email. Perfect, thank you. All right, thank you everybody who stuck around. Um, I am gonna give you the time back in your day now. If you have any other questions, please feel free to follow up with us offline. Um, but Jonathan and Brian, thank you again so much. You guys gave a lot of great insights and advice on your digital marketing trends and best practices for the new year. Um, and I learned a lot, I know our audience learned a lot. So thank you both so much for your time today. Um, audience, thank you as well. You guys had so many great questions today. So thank you for attending and thank you for sending in those questions. Um, just as a reminder, the follow-up email will be sent to you shortly. It will have the presentation materials and the playback link in it. Uh, again, if you have any questions or just any feedback, please feel free to reach out to us. There is going to be a brief survey at the conclusion of the event. If you could not close out your browser right away and fill out that survey, we would really appreciate it. Um, and this actually is our final webinar of the year. So thank you all so much for joining us throughout the year. It's been a great year and we're looking forward to 2024 and beyond. Um, if you have any topics that you would like us to cover, or if you are even interested in being a guest speaker, please feel free to reach out. You can reach me uh, directly by emailing marketing at questline.com. Um, and I would love to just hear any thoughts you have. So until next year, thank you again for attending. Take care and happy holidays. Mm -hmm.